today a little bit about this wonderful artifact. Uh, it needs to be curated a little bit. I thought I would share that with you during the process. Uh, this was in the museum for many, many years. It's a painted uh, tableto. It's on stone. Uh, we found three of these. Uh, there was only one in the literature that I've ever run across, and it was excavated by a fellow in northern Mexico, I believe it was Du Bois, in the mid-1950s. We found three of these during our work in the Southwest. This is one of them. This was in the museum for many years in this museum mount, and the, the mount has become damaged in storage. We're going to take it out of here and put it in the acid-free environment. And I thought I'd talk about the symbols that are on it. It's fascinating uh, that these survive. This one was published uh, in this book, Ancient Ancestors. There it is. That's the one we're looking at here on the table today. This is the one we'll be working on. In black and white, but it's the same. You can see it's the same symbols, same everything, really. I also noticed that both of these are missing this little corner. That could be a deliberate kill. We see that on a lot of artifacts, where they'd be damaged or broken intentionally when the Pueblo was abandoned. That might be what that's all about. But we only have two examples uh, with that kill, so it could be an accident. But we're going to remove this from the museum mount, and uh, this was in a little chamber uh, that had a little button. You push a light in the the light would the button, the light would come on, and then you could view the artifact uh, for a little, little while, and the light would go off. You don't want to have light of any kind, particularly sunlight, but any kind of light on this kind of an artifact because it will fade the colors very rapidly. Even the, the artificial lights will do that over time. So they really need to be stored in a dark place uh, when you're not viewing them or, or curating them or doing something with them. But uh, we're going to work, get this thing out of the uh, old glass. I think this is just. Uh, it's just sitting there by its own gravity, so I don't think there'll be much of a problem to remove this. Work this out of here. I think this is just siliconed in. And it's just really that little top piece of glass. You wouldn't believe how many times I've had to rework curation. Yeah, silicone is tough stuff. It should never be applied to an artifact. But that's tight. Unfortunately, there's no way to dissolve it. There's no nothing that there's no solvent for silicone. You see, the piece is just sitting there. I wonder if it will just slide out without. Let's do this. Let's. Uh, yeah, see, that's just sitting there. Yeah. Let's see. Let's top. See, that's, is that pushing on that? Ah, uh, this. Okay, that's out of the way. Uh, and that's tight as a drum. And that's siliconed all the way around. Wow. It's just loose in there, though, so... I hate to even touch it. A little bit stuck. Ah, got him. Okay. Let's see the other part of the rainbow. But I'd like to get the pressure off this corner. I can't even get a blade in there. Let me think about this a minute. This side, I have an idea. I have an idea. Right here. Yeah, that's, that's happening. The silicone is just not wanting to give it up. So what I'm going to try to do, I'm going to cut along here. And even though it's the wrong side to make a break in the glass with a cutter, I'm going to try to induce a crack after I cut. Like 
that. See, if we're on the other side, I could tap that, it would come right out. Still hasn't gone through. lot of the glass free. Boy, that's tight. It's really just sitting in there, but it's just tight enough it doesn't want to come out of there. Let me try working on that side. Uh, I have an idea. I know how to do it right. Finally managed to loosen that off. Oh. Pulling away, I don't want to touch that surface. Okay, look at the charcoal in that. And they took that right from the field, jeez. Put it in there. Okay. Okay. Much better. We'll talk about these pigments in a minute. I'm going to squish that in there too tight yet. All right. Lovely. Now for my next trick. Let's see. Is that loose at all? Yeah, it's pretty snug. All right. Let me get serious. See, that's got a little modern glass on it from getting it out of here. I don't want to mess with that. I've actually seen museum malls where they build things into the, build pieces right into the cabinetry. So they can't be stolen. <laughs> of course, sometimes the thieves will take the whole cabinet. Okay, there we are. It's out. And I'm not going to worry too much about it. I want to keep a little distance there. Okay, we got it out of there. Uh, now, in the process of removing it from that old museum display, there are now little bits of glass on there. I'm not going to try to remove them, because if I do, I'm going to lose pigment. You don't want to do that. What I'll do is I'll put a little curation note in here that says, in 2020, this piece was removed from a museum display and the glass had to be cut away etc etc and we'll uh, that'll explain how they got there but I'm not going to try to pull them off there I don't think that's a good idea. I remember when uh, at the Cleveland Natural History Museum when they were curating the Mary Rose of Henry VIII's warship they brought the ship up and they had the artifacts from the ship and at the Cleveland Natural History Museum they had them on display for a while and they had these little gold coins that were in the captain's pocket and they wanted to display them, but they were worried about theft. And uh, I remember Dr. Burroughs, uh, director at the time, having this debate with his staff about how to make a cabinet that, that couldn't be broken into. And, and the curators just said, seal them in. Just build a cabinet you, you can't open. And when, the, dis you know, when the, the display is over, when it's packed back to England, you just simply cut the cabinet apart. Well, that's kind of what we had to do today. These little glass pieces got on there, but we'll get those, you know, we'll just put a note in about that. I do want to talk about these symbols. Rainbow, two rain clouds, four, of course, four in the Pueblo mythology, four water streamers coming down, um, lightning, or the sky serpent, and this wonderful T-shape, or house, it's house, just think house, with the doorway. We see these... Uh, T-shaped entrances all over the place in the Pueblo culture, Pueblo um, architecture, particularly in kivas. We see kivas that are exactly this shape. This probably means emergence, etc. But the symbol itself means house, just basically house. And the cool thing about the house symbol, house 
is one of the first symbols that through the Rebus principle actually became a letter of the alphabet. Uh, this is a pictograph. We don't see true alphabets, alphabets in the prehistoric Southwest in the U.S. Be, and we know that because we never see linear representations, you know, whatever way you want to go. It's got to be linear if it is a uh, sound representation. Uh, if it's a pictograph, it doesn't have to be. It can be any arrangement, an association. And that's what we see. Now, these symbols have meaning. They have a unit meaning. They may even have a rebus principle meaning uh, collectively. But they never emerge into a true alphabet form. But house is one of the first uh, symbols pictographically that be, actually became a letter in ancient Mesopotamia and the uh, proto-Canaanite culture. Uh, house and water symbols or river symbols were one of the very first ones that went from a pictograph to a sound representation. It's a wonderful artifact. I'm very, very proud to have excavated it and this and a couple of others. Uh, you notice it's been drilled uh, prehistorically, and that's it was probably to hang it, might have been to hang it. This thing's quite heavy. Uh, it also might have been just to attach other ornamentation, perhaps feathers, uh, etc. Uh, wonderful piece. Happy to share it with you today.